Thank you. A late good morning. Um, again, apologies for the small delay in starting with this um, second panel, which is called the magic wand to child protection. Um, we started early in the morning with some music. Now there is some magic in here. Let's see. Um, dear conference participants, dear panelists, um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this panel. Um, we already got a, a brief introduction um, who is uh, present uh, around this table. Um, just a bit of a recalling what we have um, heard so far in the course of this conference. Um, it's about social cohesion in societies, lessons learned between regions, uh, with a particular emphasis on the local level, the immediate environment where people live, uh, work, where they go to school. Um, yesterday we heard the encouraging words from the Austrian president, Mr. van der Bellen, uh, for this conference. We have heard of the commitment from mayors uh, in the two major regions. Um, we also heard of concepts of what actually social cohesion may mean. Um, I like particularly the emphasis on collective um, empowerment, social mobility, and some that um, actually social cohesion should ultimately aim at happiness. And today we have children as the core, the target group for, for our discussion, and already in the morning I think this was a clear demonstration of happiness, of social cohesion, when we heard uh, the pro performance from um, the school children, um, giving evidence already what can so social cohesion mean in practice, what can be the contribution of young people, and at the same time, as I said, um, a statement of happiness. Um, and immediately before this panel, we heard voices from different stakeholders, from UNHCR, um, talking about the situation of child refugees, from ECBOT uh, on sexual exploitation, um, from Lebanon, oh, sorry, from, from Jordan, um, on experiences uh, for civil society, capacity building and dealing with extremism. Um, so we already tackled upon some specific areas uh, of children's rights and child rights protection. And now we have this panel assembled here, quite large group. Um, and I'm very confident that we will get some very fresh new perspectives. Um, again, we have panelists from international agencies, from the European Commission. Um, we have civil society members um, and I would give particular emphasis uh, in this respect, we have young persons present um, because also this is one of the aims of this conference, not just to talk about children and young people, but actually to talk with them. So that's a already very special welcome to Julian, you prefer with, to be called with your nickname, um, that you are ready to share your experiences. Um, with you uh, upon your situation here in, in, in Austria. And then we will, and I would like to, to start then with you and um, your um, first own insights, and then I will pass around um, the microphone, so to say, to, to our other panelists. Um, just on the format of this panel, it's basically as yesterday, so I hope we, we manage that we can have one round across the table that everyone can contribute, and then we will have a possibility for the audience to give some, some additional questions, to ask for clarifications, to give their feedback, and then perhaps if time allows, we will have a, a second um, round. Um, so, the focus now is on children, children meaning every human being below the age of 18 as it is defined in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, so basically it's about children and young people. Um, their own contribution um, and what they actually, what you 
can expect from society, from authorities, from partners around you, your environment, in order to actually strengthen your human rights. So this second day shall really add the child rights dimension to, to the discussion about social cohesion when it comes to empowerment, when it comes to principles of non-discrimination, when it comes to participation and the best interest principle, and above all, when it comes to responsibilities, who has to provide such a framework. So, in that respect, um, a clear, important uh, message is also that the responsibility for providing that framework is not something which is a, a task set to one specific authority also, uh, not just to one specific group. It's not a, an obligation for, for refugees. Um, there the, are the obligations for, for uh, governments to, to actually provide such um, basic standards. Um, but I would now be interested um, in hearing your experiences. When you arrived in 2015 in, in Austria, um, how did you feel welcome as a refugee? Um, to what extent did you find support? Um, to what extent was the explanation what is going on? Um, how did you deal with the language questions? And and what was perhaps some, if you could share some, some experiences um, about what have been the most significant obstacles perhaps, but also perhaps more important, what was most helpful for, for, uh, for you settling in this country. Um, you are now with the host family, uh, the host father being also present uh, among us. So perhaps just to, to explain a bit. And interestingly, um, I think you prefer to give your contribution in, in German, so we will switch to German language now. You have the floor. Well, when I arrived in Austria, it, this was the 14th of September 2015. I was uh, stuck at the Austrian-Hungarian border in Nikolsdorf. I simply wanted to sleep and to eat, and suddenly a few persons came and told me, we will help you. Stay here, we come they told me in English, and, uh, stay here, we'll come back. Since I was very tired, I said, well, okay, do what you want, I'm very tired. Then the next day, I was in Vienna already. So, uh, how I finally made it from Hungary to Vienna, I don't know. But it's really great that many Austrian parents voluntarily helped me and other young refugees. This was a huge degree of sympathy. It was so nice and it made me feel so well. What was your question once again? Sorry. Could you repeat it? What, what was it that supported you in you feeling, well, how, how did you come to your host family? You, your German is perfect. How did you learn German? Well, well, first I was separated from the people who brought me here. First I was at the refugee camp in Dreiskirchen for a few months. Then I was brought to an accommodation and then I had the opportunity to attend the German course and to learn the language. Then I was told that I could uh, enroll in a school. 
and this school was a very strong element for me, learning the language. Which school are you attending now? Now, I am in a um, secondary technical school, the third district of Vienna. And uh, how do you get along with your fellow students or classmates? Since uh, I am older than the average or the rest of the pupils, it's a little bit difficult to understand them. It's a nice class, but I am older, older, and of course there is a difference between us. Given the fact that I'm also a refugee, it's also things are also a little bit different. Now you will be 18 soon. But what is your official status? As far as I know, your asylum procedure is not closed yet, it's not finished yet. No, I will have an interview uh, appointment soon. And I've been waiting for this for almost 27 months. Then I will have to see what how things will work out. It will be definitely, it's definitely an exciting experience. To what extent, so in what do you get support uh, to get prepared for this appointment, for this interview? For the time being, I get a lot of support and help uh, from my guest, fa my host family, but there is also state uh, support um, uh, on the part of Caritas and other organizations, so thank goodness there are lots of organizations that provide help. Has there ever been a situation in which you thought that this has been really been great, that so many different people have uh, joined forces to help you with your problem? And uh, does, do you have an example that comes to your mind, uh, whether it is the school, uh, your host parents, uh, or the NGOs? Can you name anyone? Actually, at the beginning, when I arrived, as I said, it was a cooperation between different people. There were even people who came here from Tyrol to Vienna, and they were here for me. Only, so I was the only person because of whom they have come here. They didn't know anything about me, but nevertheless, they wanted to help me. These were the people who brought me from Nikolsdorf, so from the border to Vienna. Well, that's it. This was my situation, and actually, I have to say, I was lucky. Because there were several young people who were not as lucky as me and who were facing lots of difficulties. Now, when people found out about your background, uh, did you ever encounter a situation when people had a different attitude? Many people had some cliches uh, um, about refugees. Did, were there any situations where you thought this was not okay, how they treated you? Well, yes. For me, it was a bit... As far as I'm concerned, I could not say that I was badly treated, but I was treated differently when I attended school. Due to the fact that I was a refugee, there was a lot of prejudice that I would basically not be able to do certain things. So any time I did something wrong, they said, well, okay, he's a refugee, he doesn't know that. We can't expect him to know. Well, I don't want to say that this is bad, but it makes you feel different and consequently it made me feel bad as well. The last question for the moment. Could you share with us what a typical day for you looks like for you? Well, now of course you're not attending school now, but apart from that. Well, having breakfast, <laughs> going to school, since I go to a technical secondary school, we have different timetables which differs from day to day. For example, Monday is the worst day. I don't like Mondays at all. 
Generally, I am in school until 6 p.m. I get up at 6 a.m., uh, then I have breakfast, then I go to school until 12. Then we have a long break, and then we have school again until 6 p.m. But then afterwards, I uh, do sports, do some trading, and then when I'm back home again, I work on my computer. Well, so that's it for the time being, for the moment. All right, well, this sounds uh, quite like an everyday life, everyday situation, which is not so much different from my children's everyday lives. One of my children is also 17. Um, just like you. And so, as far as you are concerned, you have arrived well in society. It has worked out well in your case. And then we'll have a discussion with the further, further panelists about what uh, makes the difference in you being successful and in making sure that it is not only the negative headlines can, that can be read in the mass media, but for the time being, we thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you. Perhaps we will, or hopefully we will have some, some more opportunity to, to listen to you. But I, I would like now to, to switch to Margaret Jude from the European Commission. Um, quite a different level um, from the practical realities in everyday uh, life in, in Vienna to the level of the European Commission. Um, at the same time, um, as we know each other from, from before, um, you are that person dealing with children's rights within the European Commission. You are also officially the child rights coordinator. Um, you are based at uh, Director General for Justice and Consumer. Um, but perhaps, um, and you, you have been working in that area for, for so many years, have been instrumental for so many developments also on the European level in terms of standard setting, um, political lobbying. Um, but when it comes now to the question of social cohesion, um, creating, enabling, protecting environments for, for young people, what have been your experiences um, in this respect? To what extent? Or to why did you specifically focus, for example, on, on creating that kind of concept of child protection systems uh, in order to enable such an envi environment for, for young people? Thank you, Helmut, and thank you very much to Act Now for this conference and for the opportunity to be here. So Helmut asked me to say a little bit about our work on child protection systems. And, um, well, why do we talk about systems? We talk about systems because they are important. If we want to make progress, we really need to focus on systems rather than one by one for each child. Nicholas, you spoke yesterday about the case of a woman with three children and the, the hurdles she faced in having to go and fight her battles one by one all the time uh, and all the constraints. Meaning, um, and we don't have to go to Nairobi to see these challenges. In every single country in Europe, we can find similar challenges and beyond. Uh, for example, um, for children in migration, when the child protection system isn't involved, when you only have migration authorities, or if you're, you have a child with disabilities and you, as a parent, have to do battle to have textbooks that are adapted to the needs of the child every single time, that's good if a child has a parent who can and will do battle. What about if you're um, a you're a child in care, so you have no parents to care for you, you're in care and you have disabilities. Who is doing battle? Or when a state has systems that cater to children in care over here and children with disabilities over here and never the two shall meet. 
So um, we know it's really important to work at a system level. Why did we, uh, how did we start in the Commission? First of all, in 2014, lots of discussions, what is a child protection system? If you don't work in one, you don't necessarily know. So child protection system is there to protect children from violence. We started looking at integrated child protection systems. What are they? They are the way all the different authorities at local, regional, national and European level or cross-border level, because there are cases that are cross-border. If you think, for example, of a child in migration or children who go missing, they need to work together. And also the way you use the components, which are law, policy, processes, procedures, protocols, and they have to work together to form a protective and empowering environment for the child. What happens in reality is generally that we have a system and the child has to slot into the system, which might have nothing to do with their needs. Um, someone told me once of two officials sharing the same office. One was working on the case of an unaccompanied child. The other was working on a child victim of trafficking. They were each there <coughs> doing their job. And guess what? They were working on the case of the same child, but they just didn't know it because they didn't talk together. And we know all of us from all our work that's often the biggest challenge, cooperation and coordination. So using the standards, there are many standards and laws, international standards already in place, we drew up two pages called 10 principles for integrated child protection systems. You can Google, you find them. Very accessible, very practical. They don't reinvent the wheel, but they make it accessible. Mm -hmm. And then we try to embed them. For example, we give about 10 million funding a year on rights of the child and on violence against children. And we want our projects to implement those principles. And in the preparation of that work, we asked FRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency, to carry out a mapping of national child protection systems in the EU, which revealed many, many gaps and challenges. And in our work since then, we try to uh, implement them. Um, we fund capacity building in child friendly justice and child uh, protection systems, for example, training for residential care workers. Um, we're focusing now what happens when a child turns 18, whether they have been an unaccompanied child in immigration or a child in care. There are big gaps. What can local authorities do in that situation? How do they get the services to work together to uh, meet the, the needs of the children? On radicalisation also, we would recall that there are child protection systems, there are child friendly justice systems and they should be used. Um, community based care and family based care, not institutions. An Austrian mayor who spoke yesterday about the move back to dehumanising large institutions. They are not what we should be doing. Clearly they are intended, uh, even indirectly, to dehumanise people. And um, there's also the issue, I think it would be good if everyone remembered, all children have the right to protection and care. We don't have different hierarchies of deserving children and non-deserving children, in theory. In practice, it seems very much like that. So it's very much about working together, using the standards that are there, and focusing on the child. Every child have should have support and care. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Margaret. Um, both for your clear words, for, for your recommendations. Um, 
and also for, for challenging our usual ways to, to work, thinking in categories and the need to actually overcome them. Um, we, we have a representative from FRA, as you have mentioned, the Fundamental Rights Agency before, but um, I would rather like to, to have uh, Monica as a final contributor to, to the panel. Before, I would like to, to go now to the, to the ground in the regions and, and actually start with Maria uh, from Lebanon. Um, you, you're based at an NGO. Um, Kaffa, which means enough violence and exploitation, a feminist, secular, Lebanese, non-profit, non-governmental, civil society organization, um, and you, you intend to create a society free of social, economic, legal, patriarchal structures, and at the same time also work to protect the best interests of children. So what does it actually mean in practice? Sabah al khair. Good morning, I'll speak in Arabic. First of all, I wish to thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. Kaffa is a Lebanese association that was created in 2005 by female activists. Our objective is to fight against violence against children and women. We work on three subjects, the protection of women, the protection of children, and uh, um, trafficking in women and children, especially for uh, sex purposes. Today I will speak about the approach of uh, CAFA uh, in the field of uh, protection uh, of children against violence. After years of work in this field, we have adopted what we consider a global uh, holistic approach. Uh, we start working at uh, several uh, levels. Uh, the first, uh, the legislative level, we try to uh, change uh, uh, the current laws. Uh, we present uh, draft laws that protect children in Lebanon. This on one level. On uh, another level, we uh, try to develop uh, training guides for experts who work with children with the objective of uh, improving the services provided to children. We also work on uh, training care providers, those who work in the for forefront with children, on how to present services of intervention on uh, uh, children who were subject to violence, and on how to protect these from violence. We try to work directly with children and their parents. With the parents, we try to develop their capacities in order to allow them to play the role of protectors to their own children. We try to enable children in order to be able to protect themselves um, from uh, um, violence, especially gender-based uh, violence and sexual violences, violence. In addition to this, we provide direct services to uh, violence uh, survivors among the children. Today, I also wish to concentrate on another uh, point, the creation of special committees, ad hoc committees de dedicated to the protection of children. These committees uh, comprise uh, people who wish to work within their societies in the uh, on the issue of uh, protection of children uh, this includes uh, men women children teenagers who have taken the decision of playing a positive role in limiting the violence against children in their own societies this approach we call it um, community based approach uh, this approach has proven to be uh, effective because we realize that through this approach, people are more proactive, we have reached uh, concrete uh, results, and we can better protect the children. They actually help each other because uh, they are closer to the children in this way. They may protect them better. With the... Um, 
increase in the number of uh, marriage among minors in uh, Lebanon, we do not have uh, laws that actually protect against uh, minor marriages. We have 18 uh, laws that are uh, sectarian, let's say, because we have 18 sects in Lebanon. So laws have a confessional um, nature. So these committees can actually protect these people from uh, marriage among um, of minors. We have 21 committees in Lebanon now. now. I'll speak about them. Uh, they are uh, comprised of uh, individuals who wish to change their societies, their society, and so we train them on uh, many aspects. Uh, how, uh, for instance, uh, peer training, uh, awareness raising, how to be effective, uh, outreach. Uh, we train them on how on how to, for instance. Uh, uh, monitor uh, and intervene in cases of viol violence and early marriage. When we uh, started introducing men in these uh, committees, we have uh, reached better results. So in our oriental societies, we believe that men are part of the problem, part of the issue. And when we actually comprised them in the, included them in the uh, committees, we have obtained better results. These men have actually uh, changed uh, their outlook. And uh, we do realize that traditions and ideas are uh, on the basis, at the basis of this. So these men who became part of the committees have adopted a more uh, positive approach. For instance, they don't hit their children. And other men actually uh, are learning from these role models. So, uh, and they actually try to raise the awareness of other uh, parts of the society uh, on, the, for instance, the importance of education, um, uh, the early marriage as a uh, problem. Now, for instance, in the Syrian camps, these people are, live close to each other. And uh, uh, we can see, for instance, one of the committee members uh, running, a man running um, after uh, a woman who uh, wants to hit her child, for instance, in order to stop her from hitting the child. The idea is that we have to single out uh, individuals within the society who can actually uh, propagate and um, sustain and support our message that can be uh, in favor of the protection of children and women within these camps. And with our help, they can set an action plan that uh, allows us to overcome the obstacles uh, in the face of uh, the protection of children children and uh, uh, women within the camps. I'm speaking of children and women because according to us uh, in Kaffa, uh, these two issues are interconnected. Uh, these are the most vulnerable uh, parts of, the, of society, uh, namely uh, children and women. Uh, when we work on children, we must never uh, neglect uh, uh, women. When we work on children, we must not, never neglect women. And when we work on women, we must not neglect uh, children because uh, these two issues are intertwined. Thank you. And this is the only way to get to a society free of violence. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And actually, you, you promised before to speak quite quickly, so you, you kept your promise. Um, but uh, clearly, um, you shared very important insights, uh, both thinking cross-sectoral, uh, linking, for example, um, discussion and approaches which work for women, also with those who which work uh, with children, and at the same time also to have this role model approach is certainly um, the most useful, also to, to demonstrate that actually change can happen and it does work in, in, in practice. Um, so thanks again. Just um, perhaps to switch to another country, uh, to Serbia, Nikolina. Um, do you have similar experience where you can also say, um, like you uh, yourself provide, for example, legal assistance to 
um, to refugees, including to, to young people. Um, did you also have that kind of success stories where you thought, well, our court system is functioning, for, for example? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to, first of all, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to come here. It's my pleasure to address you all. Um, I am working for, as, as Helmut says, for Belgrade Center for Human Rights, which is a non-governmental organization that has been working since 95. But in 2012, we have become an uh, implementing partner of the UNHCR in Serbia for providing free legal assistance and the representations to asylum seeker and, seekers and refugees. Uh, this, it's very important in the beginning to tell you that Serbia is pro perhaps the only country in Europe that still hasn't got the law on uh, free legal aid, which means that all refugees and asylum seekers are not entitled to free lawyer by the law from the state, so the only ones who can represent them in asylum procedures, not just adults, but as well children, are uh, the lawyers financed by NGO. Uh, with the outbreak of refugee, so-called refugee crisis in 2015, Serbia was among those countries who were particularly challenged. Uh, from the beginning, we have uh, adopted this genuinely humanitarian approach where we received thousands and thousands of refugees and migrants. In one point, we had 7,000 of entries single day. But these people were staying in the country only for three days. The borders were open and uh, we did not much care about the integration or improving our asylum system. Um, however, uh, due to the recent policy changes that started with the um, EU-Turkey statement, uh, people are unwillingly, mostly, staying in Serbia, many of them after a couple of months waiting for the, something to happen, for them to get resettlement, they decide to stay in Serbia and to seek asylum. So uh, now we this is the time when we see uh, especially what are the gaps in the system and especially in the integration. So uh, I will tell you now something about asylum procedure because that's the, the thing that I uh, do. Uh, asylum procedure in Serbia is um, characterized by, uh, it's, it's, most, it's very young, it's only 10 years old and it's characterized by automatic application or misinterpretation of say third country concept, which basically means that anyone who comes to Serbia from neighboring countries which are all deemed safe by Serbian government, uh, this person will be uh, refused asylum without even deciding on the merits of the case. Just this person would be ordered to leave Serbia and to go back to Greece, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Montenegro, and to seek asylum in that country. Uh, this is very, um, this practice is very, um, we, we always say how it's bad. It's particularly bad when it comes to children. Having in mind that the decisions in cases of adults and children are, do not differ. So uh, during the procedure, uh, children who are traveling with families are most often not even being interviewed separately in the asylum procedure. Uh, the, right at the beginning, uh, the, uh, the uh, first instance body does the merging of procedure, that's how it's called, and then uh, only parents are, or usually only the father, uh, they're uh, answering to the questions. Um, that's, uh, I mean, child's right to be heard is, is um, out of the question here. Also, uh, we had a case of a single father who has came to Serbia, but father didn't have the case. The child had a case. The child should not be returned to country of origin. But nobody even took this into consideration. So during the appeal, we uh, appeal was 10 pages long, where we explained every all the child, child, child safeguards that should be taken into consideration. So uh, since 2008, only 104 persons uh, were granted asylum. Some of these people were settled by the UNHCR to other countries, other stayed, and are now fighting with uh, the problems relating to non-existing of integration in practice. Uh, Serbia has ratified all major international human rights instruments and they are, we are monist systems, so they are a part of our law and above national laws. But um, in practice it's something different. 
and usually when we speak all, all of these things, best child's interest, right to child to be heard, right to participation, it all sounds so good. But when you go to a ground to the ground, nobody actually knows how how should we do it. And um, it's we need systematic change. It's not just um, that we need to change some people who are working on the ground. We need a change in the system and to perceive that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the way to find a way how to implement uh, these uh, safeguards properly. Um, so um, unaccompanied children are in particularly difficult situation. In this regard, I would like to mention only the uh, guardianship problem, problem with the accommodation and uh, the lack of uh, durable solutions when it comes to guardianship. Um, of course, our laws, in our laws, and as well the ratified conventions, they protect all children regardless of their legal status. So it doesn't matter whether it's an asylum seeker or a child with Serbian citizenship or without citizenship. But um, it's um, the, the guardians are, uh, when it comes to imposure of uh, guardians, there are not enough guardians. So even though the minimal standards say that not, not more than 25 children should be uh, under the guardianship of one guardian, in Serbia it often happens that it's 60 or even more children. So these social workers are overburdened with, job, with work they don't have, trans, uh, the state does not provide translators, they are being provided by the civil society organizations. Um, and sometimes uh, children would not even stay as long for the social worker to can, uh, in, their, in their time, to can make a proper interview with them and let alone to make the right decision. Um, as well, when it comes to accommodation, Serbia does not have specialized accommodation for unaccompanied children. We are, uh, we have in um, I think a couple of years ago, the government made this um, bylaw saying that certain uh, existing institutions are going to be uh, give one room to accommodate unaccompanied children. Two of them are correctional facilities for uh, juvenile uh, offenders, and the and the third one is the institution for care of children with uh, severe mental disabilities. And as as like that, those country those uh, institutions cannot be a proper uh, care institutions for for children unaccompanied children. Um, so and as well, uh, I would like to say that there's still uh, these institutions are today not even as far as I know. One of them is only being used due to lack of resources and. Also, this instruction by the ministry said that as soon as a child expresses intention to seek asylum, a child should be transported to a facility which is managed by the Commissariat of Refugee, which is not a social care institution. So they are just providing accommodation for asylum seekers, and there's no care system. Um, so, and many of these reception centers do not even have special uh, rooms for unaccompanied children. And when we speak to management of these centers, these people who are working there and spending time with children, they would like to help them as much as they could, but it's, they, they just don't know how because they're not uh, in, in the area of social work. So uh, just to uh, sum up, um, we are, Serbia now needs a strategy that goes far from beyond, far beyond providing uh, urgent humanitarian assistance. Uh, to, so we have to now address the issues related to the legal status of thousands of people on our ground who are not asylum seekers and do not have any legal status whatsoever. And we also need to speak about sustainable solutions in order to guarantee their social and economic rights. As well, uh, we need institutional shifts from per perceiving these people as temporary visitors to perceiving them, um, and, who, who, and, and this uh, shift has just begun. Uh, we have only adopted the integration bylaw in, uh, to, in December 2016, even though the law in 2008 uh, said that it should be adopted even then. Uh, however, the bylaw has not yet been implemented due to public procurement, so we waited for a year. Uh, hopefully, it will become with implementation in the future period, so we will have the opportunity to judge whether it meets uh, the needs on the ground. 
as well we have to now the the positive thing to, to uh, finish with a positive thing the government has made this decision uh, to include all children in the informal education so it has been done during last <coughs> summer so it shows that that a good will and uh, organi organization together with UNICEF can bring about the change in a couple of months and 85 percent of children residing in governmental institutions were in, enrolled in uh, elementary or uh, secondary school. Uh, so um, we uh, will there, there we will also uh, like to we will also continue to support positive changes in the system to fight the system both on the ground and on uh, in, in the legal ways of course through strategic litigation what we do best so uh, we we will uh, the, everything that will be aimed at protecting uh, hum, human rights of all people uh, who are in our country uh, especially of children who cannot protect uh, them themselves. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nicolina, for, for this account, even ending on a quite positive note while at the same time showing that there's clearly a gap between principles and practice. Um, so just uh, in order to um, keep with our time frame um, to quite quickly move up from when we started from Lebanon to Serbia, now to, to Austria. Um, Rudi Luchmann from UNICEF. Um, what prompted UNICEF actually to start activities in Austria? Well, thank you very much, Helmut. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to, uh, to offer the, the UNICEF contribution to this. What I would actually like to do is I would like to maybe uh, take over from where, where Margaret left. And, and since we're here in Austria, try to, try to localize it in the, in the Austrian context, if you, if you allow me to. Now, UNICEF, as, as, as others, defines a child protection system as certain formal and informal structures, functions, and capabilities abilities, capacities that have to be assembled to prevent and respond to violence, abuse and neglect and exploitation of children. I just wanted to mention that at the very beginning, just to start from, from there basically, and yes, they do have to be integrated. Now, the challenge that we've been facing in Austria with the situation here is that, you know, we had a huge influx of, of refugees, obviously, and asylum seekers, one third of them, actually a bit more, 35% of them were children, unaccompanied, accompanied need. Now, whereas I can, I think it's safe to say they have been very well looked after when it comes to accommodation and, and, and catering, um, basic provisions um, in, in Austria, it is also true that until today um, there are certain gaps and certain gaps in the provisions of, of social uh, protection of, uh, of child protection um, systems and services. In Austria today, in Austria today, there is no national child protection standard which is valid, valid and applicable for children which are in reception and accommodation facilities. There are, however, and I just brought them with me here, there are uh, child protection standards issued by the Ministry for Family and Youth that are applicable to prevent violence um, in facilities in Austria, education and social uh, facilities. And so here we are. The development of standards for child protection has actually been at the core of our concern uh, in our work in, in Austria. Now, we would need to say, and I think this also picks up to what we heard from a variety of speakers here, that the system is pretty much um, fragmented. It's a silo approach, uh, very much like what we heard from Margaret. It matches exactly the situation here in Austria. Uh, traditionally, child protection is seen as a domain of the Ministry for, for Social Welfare, or here in Austria, the, the Ministry for, for Family and, and, and Youth. Um, yet, at the same time, it is the Ministry of Interior that is responsible um, for anything that has to do with refugee reception and, and accommodation. Um, and in order to make things just a little bit more complicated, in a federal system, that accountability is then pushed down into here in Austria nine federal states that in themselves have got a great degree of autonomy on how to, how to function in this. So what I want to say with this is basically that children are at the interface 
of two systems, which is the child welfare system on the one hand side, and it is the asylum system on the other side, and that shouldn't really clearly be the case. What we need is an integrated system, and especially so um, because it it is almost impossible to have one regulatory or normative framework um, that is basically, you know, kind of controllable if it is, you know, in the silos. And we had the examples from Margaret early of a variety of, of government ministries or other government stakeholders. Now, let's look into how to turn the challenge into an opportunity. And I think it's true to say that, you know, actors as social workers um, officials, police, government workers, magistrates, you know, at all different levels, actually are very much interested and very much supportive of finding a solution. And I think this is what I have to say, what I encountered in the past year of work in Austria has been a tremendous supportive factor that we actually got this degree of, of, of support. Now, you asked the question, what is UNICEF's role? What can UNICEF actually do? It's not our traditional business, if you will, um, to work in industrialized countries. Um, um, so UNICEF here really sees its role as the role of a catalyst um, and a convener um, of assembling this kind of, of system, of assembling and bringing together certain players, all of those that are you know, um, engaged in this. And how did we do that? And I think here we need to say that we did work with the federal authorities at the various levels, at the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Family and Youth, work with the government at the federal state levels, who work with the NGO stakeholders very, very prominently. Um, we had youth participation to develop something like draft standards for child protection on the one hand side. Um, and on the other hand, what we did is we had trainings. We trained about 500 people who are in direct contact um, with refugees and children and their families in order to sensitize them on the very special needs and the very special risk um, you know, portfolio that those children bring. And I think all of this together wouldn't have been possible if there wouldn't have been the work of the Commission um, that has been done, that have basically started to, to, to develop this broader idea on, on protection standards that really helped and guided us in this thinking and has been also a tremendous um, help for us to argue our case at the government, which is a EU member state. Um, and so I do believe um, that, um, that this is something which, you know, we have been very successful in Austria. Uh, we're not there yet. It's not the end of the journey. We still have a bit to run, but I think this is the overall framework um, in, which, in which we moved. Our demand, and just to, as, a, as a sum up, if you will, uh, is uh, to put the child at the center of all considerations. Um, our demand is to allocate the necessary fiscal space in order to put a child protection system that is truly integrated into effect that will serve those communities. Our demand is to seal the gap in the continuum of care and accountability and to integrate the Austrian experience into a European context and maybe even beyond into a global context. And that is really what we have been working here, here in Austria and will continue to do so in the future. Really an interesting role uh, UNICEF has played here and I, I like the catalyst um, aspect and that you at the same time also issued, issued already some, some demands for, for, for the follow-up and uh, perhaps just to, to have one more panelist before we, we give a possibility to the audience and to have Monica um, to give the privilege to Monica then to respond as a first contributor to the feedback we get from, from the audience. But before we um, break this up, um, perhaps Elisabeth, from uh, your perspective as a coordinator of the Austrian Child Rights Coalition uh, in terms of the monitoring also, um, what actually can you take up from the demands uh, Rudy has just uh, mentioned and what have been your experience in coordinating monitoring responses, so to say. Thank you. Yes, thank you as well for inviting me. I just have to say in advance, when I received the invitation to come to this conference, I was very happy and looking forward to listening to a lot of interesting people and hearing about interesting topics. 
But then I was asked from a colleague from Eurochild to um, be here on the panel. And so I was not so thrilled anymore <laughs> because it uh, meant um, not just listening, but preparing something for myself. So um, here I am and I will um, like to share briefly, I, I will be very um, short, um, three thoughts um, from my Austrian experience. The National Coalition uh, for the Implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, was established 20 years ago um, to be in this process of examining uh, states how they fulfill, implement children's rights. So in the Convention on the Rights of the Child it is said the states have to report and we are very interested as well what the civil society say and we are very interested what do young people say as well. So we had to do our first supplementary report. We were 11 member organizations. Nowadays, 20 years later, we are 44 member organizations and they come from all fields of children's rights. So a really broad um, yeah, variety of topics. And um, I would say now, 20 years later, it is very important, as you asked, um, for good, for, to do a good job in monitoring, to have this broad um, variety of organizations and topics all together and that they work together as well. Um, and it's just because of this cooperation of all the member organizations that you can create a protective and respectful environment for young people. Um, Besides of this um, supplementary report, we do advocacy and political lobbying and we try um, as a network to do some events of um, child participation. Um, it was the question as well to bring some examples and so I just want to um, share two examples with you. Uh, one was called Young Politics a Project. We gathered 30 young people from all over Austria um, with very different backgrounds. So school, working, no work, also asylum seekers. And we um, prepared them, we had two weekends with them and then they had the opportunity to um, talk one hour with a political politician they wanted to meet. So here's one as well um, with us, Alef Korun, she was one um, the young people wanted to talk to. They also wanted to talk to Hatzi Strache and it was very interesting. And we said for us it's important that adults listen to children and young people. This can make a change. They have to get to know the views of young people because young people are the experts of their lives and their environment. So I'm very happy as well that Julian is here and was the first one who talked as well. Um, another example was that we organized a press conference um, at the International Day of Children's Rights, 20th of November, two years ago. And the panel was just um, asylum seekers, young ones, some just three months in Austria, others 20 years who came with their families, and the audience or the journalists were school classes. So it was just young people talking and the media listening, um, and it was really impressive how they handled everything. And talking of school classes, um, this is already the last point for me. I'm very convinced if you want to have social cohesion in our society, you have to shape social cohesion in our classrooms. Um, I looked up what cohesion means um, and there was one definition, the act of sticking together. So children like to stick together as well. And uh, one story which happened last year was in the class of my youngest daughter when she was seven years old, first class of primary um, school. And 
We have two teachers who write a letter to the parents every week. They tell us what they had done this week and what they will do next week. And then in May last year, there was the letter when they said at the end, we are thinking a lot if we should tell you, but finally we decided we want to tell you there is one thing um, yeah, which worries us, which worries us a lot. Every time when children hand over their birthday party invitations to other children just in front of the classroom, that is Oday, who is one uh, boy from Syria, waiting in the corner if he will get an invitation letter. And he has big eyes and he never has received an invitation letter till now. So the teachers told us maybe you can think about to invite Odai one day at a party of your children as well. And it was so nice that they had told us because we haven't thought about it as well. And from this moment, Odai has been invited to a lot of parties and um, found more connection to the rest of the, of the class as well. So um, I think it needs just some guidance open eyes, um, helpful hands. As Julian said at the beginning, he, he had the experience there were people, die waren nur für mich da. They were just here for me. And also this, maybe this goes together with the example of Odai. Um, ich wurde nicht schlecht behandelt, aber ich wurde anders behandelt. Just, we don't treat them worse, but in another way. And it shouldn't be this, I was lucky, it should be for everybody and not to oversee who is waiting for a birthday party invitation. Okay, yes. thank you Mr. Sachs, we make an interruption here. Now it's time for the audience, it's time to share your experiences and your questions. Like yesterday, first talk to your neighbor for some minutes and then we have time for these 45 second statements from the audience, questions, reflections. Yes, yes, she's coming. Okay, so two, three, five minutes, share your experience with your neighbor now. Questions, discussions, reflections. <laughs> I think so. Is it needed for it to be... Okay, thank you very much. Now it's time for some statements. You are the second one. Uh, brief statements, brief questions. There's just one more speaker left. We didn't forget her, but we want to make this interruption. So you have the first. So. Okay, 45 seconds. Okay. Please pay attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The topic of this session deals with child protection. And I want to talk about my experience in the region of Kurdistan. We have benefited a great deal from uh, art making activities on a personal level and on a group level as well. It is best 
and very useful to repeat such an experience elsewhere. And maybe you can give this uh, topic a very uh, important uh, interest because it is very good to, for children to express themselves. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, all right, thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, the, German, the question in German so that everyone can understand me. The first question is whether you have understood that Afghan asylum seekers are treated differently in the asylum procedures than Turk, Kurdish or Iraqi refugees. Perhaps you could tell me whether you have learned this from anyone. Secondly, what is your opinion about integration? What are the expectations of your Austrian friends when they tell you you have integrated well in Austria? Thank you. Uh, Thank yeah, you. So Just a second. Oh, okay, give a brief answer. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, über the. Well, when we talk about different uh, ways of treatment in asylum procedures, I cannot say too much about this because I am still uh, in, uh, in midst the asylum procedure, so I, can, I don't have so much experience in that regard. But as far as I know from friends who have undergone these procedures, I can say that there are different assessments as far as that question is concerned depending on nationality. Well, this is my answer. And uh, as to integration, well, in the first year when I attended school, we had two or three asylum seekers in our class, and since I could integrate more quickly than the others, I could communicate uh, with my classmates much faster than the others could. So in my opinion, it was important for my classmates that I can treat them well. And I can get along well with them. I don't know how to say this. Since uh, my culture was different from their culture, we could not really get along well at first. But then things went on better. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hassan Rohaiba. My question is directed as Maria Saman. Do you not think that in Lebanon and in the Middle East that civil society organizations have a very heavy burden indeed and uh, they need to really coordinate with uh, some local organizations in Europe to have some assistance in order to bring together a joint approach between the East and West? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. In Lebanon, we do suffer from lack of funding uh, in the absence of uh, state sponsorship or uh, uh, private sponsorships to civil society organizations. This is a heavy burden indeed. And that uh, somehow makes us not independent from the donor. And uh, we feel always that we are living in expectation uh, in the hope that the donors could give us funds and so we can give uh, our service efficiently. What affects us uh, at the moment is that with the lack of funding that uh, we are receiving due to the fact that services are now directed towards the Syrian refugees, Refugees. We, when we look at uh, offering services to, for uh, protection, we find that we are not able to do uh, our role and fulfill our duties, especially when we're talking about uh, psychological uh, counseling or assistance uh, to people. Or perhaps, as our colleague from Kurdistan talked, some uh, art activities. So we are not able to give a complete range of services as we should. Thank you. Here. 
Hello, the major uh, Signore Zavaglia wants to know from you, Ali Reza, if you see your future here in Austria, what are your plans and if you see your future here in Vienna? Io volevo dire che mi ha colpito molto la sua storia. I momenti brutti e i momenti positivi della sua odissea. Ok. Uh, he also wants to say uh, he is impressed by your story, by your strain, strength with, uh, which you affronted the difficult situation and yes, he is impressed by your story. Thank you. Uh, vielen Dank für die Komplimente. Well, thank you very much for uh, these compliments. Ja, ist, well, my plan is ich mir ein Ziel the following. Uh, I have set myself nämlich, also uh, the objective. Ich mach gern, uh, uh, yeah, the following objective. Computer. I love programming. Und, I love working uh, with computers. Ich würde gern and I would like to work professionally in this field and start a career. What's good about this, when I came to Austria, I can really say that now I have a goal, I have an objective, a, a purpose, which was not the case before I had come here. And I actually, I have many plans. All right, thank you. I have a short question, and that is if we have figures of uh, the children who have been deported over the period of time, either from Europe or the Middle Eastern countries, do we have data on that? Thank you. Thank you. So let us collect two or three of this point. Hello, uh, my name is Rami Shama, I'm from Lebanon. Uh, if we're talking about children and youth, we're talking about knowledge, attitude, practices, and values. And it's very important when we look at those four pillars that we talk and we give importance to education, which is something that is uh, more sustainable, can be looked at on a long-term le long level. And I would like to know what would be the role of the municipalities in this, the INGOs into integrating more uh, the concept of education and uh, supporting it, and also uh, how can we benefit from the private sector as well and the interventions that we are making. Thank you. Thank you. One more here. Hello, thank you very much for the massive uh, expertise we were allowed to hear about. My name is Alev Koron, former MP from the Austrian Green Party. Uh, I would especially like to ask the international guests of ours, I mean, not Austrian experts and people, uh, um, if you know about best practices um, concerning the equal treatment of minors in your countries or in the countries you know from. Because in Austria, we have been having the problem uh, that, that minor is not minor, unfortunately. Uh, it should be, on, it should be uh, um, legally that way, but it's not the case. Thank you. So thank you very much. Back to you, Mr. Sachs. So some questions have already been answered and addressed, um, but we, we got quite a, um, a lot of, of additional questions. Perhaps, um, perhaps first, um, in, in terms of data collection, um, I think there are perhaps more qualified persons in, in the room, like uh, thinking of UNHCR and IOM. Um, definitely there are data available on uh, the return of children. Um, after um, the, 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 the various asylum processes, uh, migration. Um, so perhaps that's something uh, we, we can get in touch uh, during the, the, the lunch break, actually. Uh, apart from that, um, the questions to, to Julian have already been um, answered. I, I still have a question on the importance of education and the, the, the local level. Um, the question on equal treatment um, of um, young people. 
um, and the role of nationality perhaps in, in that context. Um, and then there was the, the general question how to link up between uh, NGOs in the Middle East with NGOs in, in, in the European region. Um, but b before giving the floor to, to the other panelists, I would like Monica to, to explain briefly um, the role of FRA, because the Fundamental Rights Agency has engaged in various projects, actually touching on these issues. So you have worked with asylum seekers, um, Margaret has mentioned the, the mapping on child protection systems, um, the role of education, data collection is one of your, your cornerstones. So perhaps you can integrate some of these aspects from the audience already, and then I would just invite the, the other panelists um, to further comment on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, at the FRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency, thanks for the invitation. Um, we do work at um, European level, national level, but also at no local level. So in the local area, we focus very much on the um, issues of children and uh, migration, asylum-seeking children. So um, I would like to bring some points uh, from that experience, um, how to strengthen how to work with local authorities uh, for that purpose, for protection of asylum seeking children. Some of the issues were already mentioned, uh, not only by the speakers, but also by the, by the intervention and the ammonium. So just to wrap up, because I'm very conscious of, of the time, um, I also want to, to, to announce that uh, I think it's next week we are producing, we are publishing a report which actually deals with this issue of what is the impact on local communities of the migration. A phenomenon. So just some points from, from there um, and in relation to child protection. First of all, um, coordination. That's for me the key element. That's the key element um, in the field of general migration. I'm just coming from uh, doing training on child protection in the Greek hotspots. Um, we have been training uh, the child protection staff that has been appointed only recently in September by the reception authorities there. So we are doing a round of trainings and there we are putting together um, this new child protection staff, national staff, with some of the child protection actors that work in the hotspot itself. And still is um, very, very surprising to see the lack of information, the lack of tools there is in between them to basically understand who is doing what, who is responsible for what, at which moment, and so on. It's true that the, the situation in the hotspots, uh, at least in Greece, is still very on emergency mode. Um, there's still a lot of uh, arrivals. There's still a lot of gaps in basics basic uh, needs. Um, so here the coordination is very, very important and uh, we have seen also a very important role also of international actors like UNHCR who has worked on referral systems in the hotspots, but not all of them have that, not all of them are really implemented in practice, maybe the national partners are a bit out, they are not totally involved in the procedure, so there are still some, some gaps, but again, coordination uh, main point there. Another point that we heard, interaction with local community, um, social cohesion, how to um, promote that. In this report I mentioned earlier, which actually covers um, only the municipal level in 14 member states, we pick up two municipalities in um, the, these 14 member states. In Austria we picked up uh, Bilach in Kärnten and uh, Graz. And there we look into some experience of how to facilitate this interaction. So one a key element was location of reception centers, very important. And we see that in many municipalities, the reception centers are somewhere in the periphery of the city. This really does not facilitate interaction. And the second point is education. Somebody in the audience mentioned education. And I think, Julian, you were one of the lucky ones because generally education is being provided but under the age of compulsory education. So in the, in the member states we studied, yes, up to 15, 16, more or less, there's formal education, uh, but after that, it's not always the case. It's still a very, very challenging situation. And this, for example, doesn't apply to children in the hotspots. They don't even access, access um, compulsory education yeah, under the age of 16. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there. I think there are also in our report a couple of examples of how to build trust between 
local communities that are there already before the arrival of the asylum seekers and the local authorities. And actually some of the good practices come from Villach a municipality where there has been a lot of engagement between the local authorities and the existing local community, how to integrate the asylum seekers, how to make it better. Um, there were lots of proposals, input from their side, and these were really follow up, taken seriously, and there were this interaction. So the, um, actually the, the level of racism and xenophobia has been also decreased a bit, which is because I, I think nobody mentioned this, but this is also, I think, a real problem which affects the children directly also. We have all have seen images of um, parents demonstrated against uh, asylum seekers uh, getting into school in some member states. So this is something also that we have to, to address. And I leave it maybe there. Thanks a lot, and thank you also for, for your flexibility. Um, still, um, perhaps because we, we started a, a bit later, if we can add just by about eight minutes, so that every one of you, especially as there is still this question to the international um, uh, actors on good practices in terms of how to prevent discrimination of uh, children, asylum-seeking children, um, to the, perhaps Rudy, Margaret, you want to, to address the question, and for everyone else, if you w would have a, a final statement, a final recommendation um, to the audience, um, this was, would also be most welcome. But perhaps first to, to address the question of equality and discrimination, Margaret? Thank you. In the Commission communication of the 12th of April 2017 on the protection of children in migration, it included EU actions and recommendations on a very practical level to member states, including in the area of education, where we recommend access also to early childhood education and care, not just primary and secondary school, but on good practice and discrimination. We know that there are many, many great things that are done at all different levels by a host of different actors. So what we committed to in the communication and what we've just started piloting last week is a tool or a database to collect good practice from whoever, wherever, to protect children in migration. And the idea is that people would input the practice themselves. Uh, we won't evaluate the practice, but we would do a light validation, and then it's available for all to share. Uh, Nicholas, you pointed out that you can't just lift something always from one country and replicate it in another, but um, that would be very useful. Data on returns, there is no European data on returns disaggregated for children. There are steps underway to improve the visibility of data on children migration. In February, March, there will be a new Eurostat section on children migration, so we start seeing some improvements there. Okay. Yeah. Just on, on, on best practices uh, and the question uh, at the back there, um, well, I think the issue of silos again comes into the discussion and we have certain member states that have um, separated systems for asylum seeking children and for just children in general. So I think uh, some of the good examples are those that these two systems are working together, are merged, or they are just one system. Um, and just maybe to mention, uh, for example, the case in Ireland, and Ireland has of course, very few asylum seekers, but the reality is that they don't have a parallel system. They have the child protection system, which takes care of whatever child they have without, in the case of unaccompanied children, for example, without parental care, that would be one service for all of those children. That's maybe something to look at. Any final remarks from, from, from the panelists? Because um, perhaps just for giving a, a last word to you, Julian, um, for, for me it became quite evident uh, on the one hand, the, as mentioned before, there's no shortage of standards, there's no shortage actually also of, of tools, but for some reason they do not reach the right people, the right uh, groups to, to actually be, be implemented. And from my perspective, this still has to, to do with the lack of attention. 
um, being paid to children as a target group in, in society. And I think this panel has clearly shown the need that children deserve specific attention. Childhood is a, a unique phase in, in personal life with specific needs, challenges, uh, but also resources. Um, there's always this discussion about agency and competence of, of children and the need to actually involve children and receive their feedback in all these services uh, we devise for, for them. Of course, there's always the role of parents or families to be taken into account. And ultimately, it's a question about the responsibilities um, to ensure social cohesion, access to justice um, for, for children. Um, but listening, listening all to, to all these comments, Julian, any final suggestion would, you would have? Uh, a big question at the end um, in terms of what would bring you closer to achieve the career that the plans you have for, for your own personal education? Uh, well, on the one hand, for a refugee or an unaccompanied minor refugee, support is definitely important which many of us uh, get. On the other hand, as far as I'm concerned, from my personal experience, I have to say that when I wanted to study, I was simply not able to perform um, better because I was uncertain about my asylum status and I didn't know what my future would look like. And I never knew whether I will be extradited uh, or deported or not. And uh, then in this case, I thought it wouldn't make much sense to study too much because I would be wasting my time. Time. So you are constantly left in the dark and in security. So in my view, it is important for a young person or a teenager to have a strong base. And in many cases, we don't have this base. This is my last word or my last statement. Thank you. Okay, very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, really. I think I I think it just clearly shows how important it is to to give a clear perspective to have stability in 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 your own life and that we have to work around that. And actually, actually, I think your situation is an example actually that it can work uh, if um, stakeholders, people are actually committed and work together. Um, so ultimately, we do not need a Harry Potter and magic um, to to assist, but really, it's up to us to um, strengthen and take the resources we already have um, to achieve our intended goals. So, thanks to to the panelists. Thanks, Julian, again. Thank you to the the audience and for your patience. And thank you again to Act Now for having had this panel. Thank you. Sharing the session. Um, before we go for lunch, I would.